Thank you all, and thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Am I mic'd? No? Great, okay. Uh, I mean, I am, obviously, but it's for the recording. Um, I just want to start with the acknowledgement of country. I think it's always important to acknowledge that an Aboriginal person walking on country today is much more likely to be searched for drugs than a person like me. I see that every day in King's Cross, where I live. Um, the criminalization of drug use isn't wrong because it's racist, it's wrong because it's unjust and discriminatory, but it is racist in the way that it is applied. And that's something I think that uh, I always try to bear in mind in making that acknowledgement of country that there are real effects that go on, of course, continue right now, um, that continue that tradition of dispossession and the criminalization of drug use is one of the, one of the, um, the, the laws that perpetuate that form of discrimination. So uh, today is about the national drug strategy, uh, a topic which I absolutely love. My, my interest in the national drug strategy is actually relatively recent. I am a late, a late bloomer on this topic. Uh, I think that the 2010-2015 strategy was the first one that I really engaged with in my work as a program evaluator and as a researcher working for government on programs that um, involved um, both prohibited uh, drugs as well as alcohol and tobacco. I have, of course, an increasing interest in the strategy in relation to my work with Unharm and uh, was particularly interested in the process around the development of the current strategy and I'll talk through that process today. One of my favourite things about the current strategy is the graphic art, which is, I think, the best graphic art of any national drug strategy to date, and I've used it as a theme throughout the presentation. I've also used purple as the accent colour, reflecting the uh, quite fantastic graphic design here, which is from the cover. Just briefly, though, uh, contextualising, I guess, my interest in the national drug strategy in relation to my own story, um, I am a person who uses prohibited substances. That is definitely part of the pathway that has brought me here today. Um, that, you know, my, my initiation into use of drugs like MDMA was through the club scene. I was um, very much into uh, the night nightclub scene in my teens and into my early 20s and MDMA and other prohibited substances were definitely part of my experience. I had some of the best times of my life in nightclubs using MDMA uh, and similar sorts of substances, and I continued to use cannabis. Unfortunately, my nightclub days are largely over. I have two small children, and um, that killed it. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that began to change my perception of drug use was moving to King's Cross, and I did that about nine years ago. One of the things that I, really struck me about the cross is that thing you hear so often about when people talk about drugs, the street. It's so clear in the cross that the street is a phenomenon of poor and marginalised people's drug use. I've never bought, sold or used drugs on the street. I have access to private space, to home delivery, to uh, opportunities to purchase in domestic environments shielded from view, to um, the capacity to purchase legal representation should it come to that, or even access to private uh, health insurance to pay for um, treatment, if, if, that if that were necessary. But on the streets of the cross, you see that the people who are being stopped and searched by the police are overwhelmingly homeless. Uh, people who exhibit signs of mental illness, people who are Aboriginal um, or, well, they're, I was going to say Torres Strait Islander, but they're actually um, more likely Aboriginal. And streaming past these people, uh, you know, I've on many occasions been struck by these situations where there is an, one that really stuck with me, an Aboriginal man looking up to the police officers who were standing over him, spreading his possessions over the street in front of McDonald's with a look of complete resignation, as if this were just one more of a constant procession of things that he had to deal with. Not even outraged, just simply re resigned. And streaming past this scene were hundreds of people who uh, were on their way to the station, on their way to professional jobs, the majority of those people would have committed precisely the same offence that this person was being searched in relation to. And that is the social justice issue, I think, that is really at the core of this work. I don't really see law reform or even harm reduction as sufficient to orient um, my own work or the way that I think about 
what I do and the kind of advocacy and activism I try to promote is much more about equity and justice. And I think it's encapsulated in a sense like that that really inspired me to do this kind of work. So I worked in research and program evaluation for um, a company that consulted to government primarily on programs related to alcohol and other drugs. And we were typically evaluating the demand or harm reduction side of the national drug strategy. One of the things that really struck me in that work was that uh, there was this incredible silence around a couple of things, one of which was that the people with whom one interacts in those kinds of environments have probably all committed the offence, uh, you know, the offence of use or possess prohibited substances, even while we continue to talk about drug use and people who use drugs as if they were remote from ourselves. They were objects of intervention that were almost depersonalised, very remote from the people in the room. The second thing was that there's a, pious, a piety sorry, about collaboration between agencies, and I'll talk a bit about that later on, interagency collaboration. Love it, you know, you'll see it in the National Drug Strategy, it's always there. And every time we go to a meeting that involves interagency um, interactions um, with government, there's always the person who says, we've got to get out of our siloed way of thinking. You know, that has become the cliche of, uh, of interagency work but that the collaboration between health and police never acknowledged the fact that the laws that police were enforcing had nothing to do with health. That, for example, police who were being um, pulled into collaborations with health agencies were uh, continuing to enforce the criminalisation of drug use, which is directly opposed to the objectives of the National Drug Strategy. I'll come back to that point later on. So that was something that really inspired me on this particular paths to think uh, beyond that kind of environment where some of the really fundamental questions seem to be left unasked. But at the time I had no capacity to kind of articulate an alternative. I remember trying to talk to one of my brothers about um, the need for a kind of systemic change in relation to um, drug laws but also practices around drugs and he was very on board with the idea but I think in the context of that conversation we both recognised that I didn't have the language. Um, I couldn't articulate how an, what an alternative might look like and how that might make sense beyond a small group of people who were already on board. And that began a journey of talking to a very wide range of people, many of whom work here at this university, for which I'm very grateful, to formulate a kind of position, uh, an alternative, a new way of thinking that we could elevate through unharmed. So, um, that is more or less what I'm presenting here today as a reflection on the current national drug strategy and a, um, a call to action, I suppose. I am an activist. I have a background in academia. Some of my best friends are academics, but I am an activist. And the purpose of this is much more uh, to articulate a problem and perhaps a way of thinking about a solution, but also to identify, I think, a need for an intervention. So... The National Drug Strategy. <clears throat> so this is the cover art. So, um, no, I'll skip right over this. Here we go. What is a strategy? Starting off with a pretty fundamental question. A strategy is a plan of action. Look, I Googled it, right? This is the Oxford um, Online Dictionary definition, a plan of action. And it's a really telling definition. Because what the National Drug Strategy does not contain is an implementation plan. There is no plan of action in the National Drug Strategy, not in the current version. And in fact, on the cover of the National Drug Strategy, in fact, refers to itself as a framework. And I think that this is a more appropriate kind of um, terminology to use. So let's call it a framework then. So inside the framework, Let's get a frame. Inside of the framework is this thing that you've probably heard about, the three pillars. Demand reduction, supply reduction, and harm reduction. The uh, th three pillars that have not actually been part of the National Drug Strategy for its entire history, but are now accepted as almost like the furniture, I suppose, that they have a permanent kind of position. But I think one of the really remarkable things about <laughs> about this is that everything fits in there. 
not quite everything. For example, not, uh, let's say, mandatory treatment is not in the national drug strategy. But there's an extraordinary range of activities within the strategy that pull often in different directions. Um, there are, there's something for every, everyone in there. And it's a wide, like a wide range of diversion, sometimes contradictory, excessive, and also at the same time, insufficient areas for action. So just stepping back a bit to the process of creation of the current national drug strategy, because I think that too is telling. There was um, a pretty limp consultation with no publication of submissions. This is the consultation strategy. Um, this is from the uh, drugstrategy.gov.au website. Um, and I've just highlighted a couple of passages there that the draft strategy was developed on the basis of uh, extensive consultation and perhaps some people in the room will have been involved in that consultation. I wasn't personally. Um, but, but what I heard wasn't glowing. Uh, I note also the second one is that the th um, deadline for feedback was October 2015, which was the um, 30th anniversary of the National Campaign Against Drug Abuse, which was the first national strategy, and that you could provide contact details, telephone and email, for further queries regarding the response. Now, I put a submission in and I never heard back. I'm not sure, perhaps there are other people in the room who did hear back from the, um, from the group that uh, redrafted the strategy and I'd be interested to hear if you did about what that consultation involved. Just as a point of comparison, and 1998 was a complicated year in relation to the national drug strategy and it was uh, the early years of the Howard government, but just to give you a flavour, this is how the 1998 consultation was represented. You don't necessarily have to read all that, but just uh, the point here is that consultation was a big deal, right? Even if, you know, consultation is a contested and problematic thing with government often done poorly, but nevertheless, there is a level of commitment to the um, process of consultation represented here in 1998 that is very different from the process that we saw in the creation of the current drug strategy. In fact, this is a, this is a little joke. This is uh, essentially the launch strategy for the current national drug strategy. This is in the entirety of the publication or the um, Entirely, uh, the, the, this is the PR strategy for the current strategy, right? A single email. It came out on a Thursday afternoon, a month, about a month or so ago, a little longer perhaps, oh no, July 21, with no fanfare, no PR, no press, nothing. Uh, and note also that this was July 21, 2017. So uh, 18 months after the consultation process closed for the um, draft strategy. And so, the, you know, 18 months after the pre, or um, approximately 18 months after the previous, the term of the previous strategy had elapsed. So we celebrated 30 years since the first national drug strategy with no strategy at all. Again, I think it's telling. And also telling is that if you Google national drug strategy, which is something that I've been doing a little bit lately, the first result is the national drug strategy page. This is a government page, drugstrategy.gov.au. And one thing that you one notes, like I did when I tried to find the national drug strategy on this page, is that it's not even there. They've not even updated the main web page. Great. Another notable feature, and here I am relying on some uh, research from this university, a uh, piece that Perry Lancaster and Alison Ritter published uh, a couple of years ago, is that um, in comparison with previous strategies, there's a one notable feature of the current one, which is that there's no authorship. No one is claiming responsibility for the strategy. So while you know, the, the, in, in this column, you can see that there are a range of authors and there are organizations, there are intuitions about authorship rather than, you know, actual people. But nevertheless, 
as far as I can tell, and let me know if anyone else has been able to find one, I couldn't find anything in the National Drug Strategy that explained uh, or you know, took responsibility for authorship of the strategy. Okay, so that's where we're at with the National Drug Strategy. As to contextualise the main part of the, pre the presentation today, which is about the concept of harm minimization and whether it has an ongoing utility as an um, organizing concept for the national drug strategy framework thing. My argument uh, is that it does not. Now, over the years, the mission or aim of the national drug strategy has become longer and more elaborate. And again, I'm relying on Carrie and Allison's work here. One of the really interesting things is that it started with a very minimal aim to minimize the harmful effects of drugs on Australian society. And it has progressively become longer. And you'll note also that a um, two things. One is that a prevention concept. Uh, sorry, here's, here's the... Um, mission or aim of the current national drug strategy. It's the longest one yet. And there's a couple of notable features here. One is that the, preve a pre the prevention concept has emerged in the national drug strategy for the first time. Now, it's been on the agenda since the early 2000s. There have been a bunch of papers and um, various publications where people have argued for the introduction of a concept of preventing harm as, a less, um, a as an alternative to harm minimization. And finally, under the Turnbull government, it made it in. The second notable feature is that this introduction of a positive aspiration, which happened only in the 1998-99 National Drug Strategy to improve health and so social and economic outcomes at that point, which then evolved into this uh, more holistic kind of aspiration to build safe, healthy and resilient communities. This kind of concept, um, which was expressed in the previous strategy as to build safe and healthy communities, so without the resilience concept, was introduced in the 2010-2015 strategy, which explained that socially inclusive communities and resilient individuals and families are less likely to engage in harmful drug use. In this sense, safe and healthy communities can be understood, and I think correctly, as a primary strategy for minimizing harms, i.e. harm minimization comes from safe and healthy communities rather than that safe and healthy communities are, uh, rather than that harm minimization is a sufficient way to achieve safety and healthful communities. But that explanation of the rationale has disappeared from the current version, even while that aim of safe, healthy, and now also resilient communities has been retained. Um, sorry. One of the things that um, is notable also, also about the way the harm minimization framework is represented in policy documents, including in the National Drug Strategy, is that it always gets a big rap. You know, people think that it's fantastic. Here it's described as progressive, balanced, and comprehensive. And versions of those words can be found through previous drug strategies, uh, previous accounts of Australia's national drug strategy, um, both in Australia and UN documents. And it changes around a bit, but these kinds of concepts, especially balanced and comprehensive, are always there. Even I've said it. There you go. This is off the Harm Reduction Australia website. Arguably, everyone thinks it's good because it provides a framework we can fight within, because just about everything fits inside the frame, and little of what we individually might support is excluded. But reading the current version of harm minimization, so this is from the 2720. 17, 20, 26 version, the current version, it subtly introduces an interesting concept, especially here in this last um, phrase, does not condone drug use. And I would say that this is the emergence of the prohibitionist, abstentionist framework into the national drug strategy. And it reflects a process that has been going on over the long term, um, but has emerged into 
uh, you know, into the strategy itself here. Condone is a really interesting word, and sometimes you'll hear people who I would regard as allies use the term condone. So condone, I think we um, need to place a bit more attention on. Condone, here, I Googled this one again from the Oxford uh, Online Dictionary. Condone to accept a behavior that is considered morally wrong. So this definition of harm minimization is a departure from the original meaning of harm minimization in a way that problematizes drug use. You know, it is implicitly saying drug use is morally wrong and strengthens the move towards a top-down problem, uh, problem management which is, again, relying on Carrie and Allison's work, a, a problem that they raised in a paper uh, published a couple of years ago. The problem, problematization of drug use meant that the policy focus became the authoritative management of individuals' drug-using behavior, i.e. through prevention of initiation to use altogether, or medical treatment, or limiting access through supply control, or harm reduction interventions for particular at-risk groups. In turn, acceptable solutions came to be constructed as top-down in nature. I couldn't agree more. And I think that um, in, in order to understand what's being excluded here, this is just one example, but a historical example from 1978 from the South Australian, the South Australian Royal Commission into the Non-Medical Use of Drugs. Now, this is a way of talking about drug, drugs and drug use that is completely absent from the kinds of ways that it's talked about in the current national drug strategy. People acting within their own families and local communities have the opportunity to develop or redevelop values and norms appropriate to the ways in which drugs, including alcohol and tobacco, are used, thereby discouraging any unwarranted behaviour and encouraging responsible decision-making. Drug use, after all, was common before governments took a hand in trying to control it. So what we're dealing with now with the national drug strategy, something which is often described as having been continue, or more or less continuous over its 30 year period, is actually radically different from some of the ideas that were circulating around the period which led up to the development of the national campaign about drug abuse. <laughs> Sorry, national campaign against drug abuse. Um, here too, this is a really important text, sometimes called the Bohm the Bohm Report, because it was uh, the a publication that came from a Senate inquiry chaired by Peter Bohm, and then was published as this uh, book called Drug Problems in Australia: An Intoxicated Society. And it represents, I think, a particular way of framing what was, I think, the antecedent to harm minimization, based on the idea that prohibition didn't work, and that reducing the harms was the best that we could do within that reduced kind of aspiration. We wanted to eliminate drugs from the world, but too bad, it isn't possible. So let's do the next best thing, which is toward reducing their adverse effects. Just a side note, it, it's quite eye-popping to read this 30, 40 something years on. It was published in the 1970s. Some of the recommendations that it made are the same recommendations that get made about drug policy today. For example, there's a need for greater evaluation of the supply control part of the national drug strategy. And there are a range of other recommendations that are essentially exactly the same recommendations um, yeah, that, that, that continue to be made. Another piece, of, another historical, not necessarily representative, but I think insightful text is this one, which is just a short quote excerpted in a paper that was published by the Australian National Council on Drugs in 2002. And this is an account from a man called Earl Hacker who participated in a uh, workshop that led up to the development of the national campaign about drug abuse and he is essentially describing his experience of the workshop. Retrospectively, I think we have this idea that because this harm minimization framework is like a shining beacon for Australian policy creation that kind of led the world, you know, and is like all those terms that I've discussed before, balanced, 
progressive, comprehensive. I think that it creates a sense that it was kind of like somehow created out of a process of extraordinary fantasticness of some sort, whereas I think that this kind of account suggests something different. That perhaps incoherence rather than coherent brilliance defined the national drug strategy from the start. Now, speaking of incoherence, let's look at the national, sorry, let's look at the uh, demand reduction strategies. Now, this is from the current national drug strategy. Lots of these are great. Improving community understanding and knowledge, reducing stigma and promoting help seeking. Programs focused on building protective factors, addressing underlying social health and economic determinants of use. I'm not, you know, singling these out because they're better than the others. I just prefer them and I'm going to talk about some of these concepts later in the presentation, but I draw your attention in particular to the one at the bottom. Diversion initiatives. So diversion is, um, most of you are probably familiar with this, but just in case not, diversion is the idea that the criminal justice system is not necessarily the right place for a person caught particularly in possession of a personal quantity of drugs and that, um, that programs now exist to divert those people out of the justice system in many cases into some sort of brief health-based intervention. It was, uh, the diversion framework was something that was championed by John Howard, oddly enough, who funded a national framework for diversion during his prime ministership. Now, looking at this, and I've looked closely, and in fact, I even got the loosest Aussie bloke to have a look around. I don't know if you know this guy, but you should check him out on the internet. Now, he checked it out, and what he found was that criminalizing drug use is nowhere at all. The National Drug Strategy does not endorse the criminalization of drug use. At the same time, drug consumer arrests are going up. So this is a chart, it is uh, going right up to 2013 to 2014. I've standardized it at per 100,000 people to account for any population change. And the trend is quite striking, it's quite recent. After a 10 year period, we've seen this uptick, especially just in the last uh, two or three years. So drug, cons drug consumer arrests, I just want to pause on this, uh, on this slide and on this point because it is pretty fundamental to what I'm talking about. Drug consumer arrests continue in Australia today despite consensus that they do not contribute to the objectives of the national drug strategy. The current strategy does not endorse or even mention it, um, drug consumer arrests, but it does endorse diversion initiatives as good practice. And this position is widely supported by the Australian community. 68% of Australians think that possession of cannabis for personal use should not be an offence. And more than half support alternatives to criminalisation for personal possession of ecstasy, heroin, methamphetamine and hallucinogens. In practice though, despite a lack of strategic guidelines, explicit objectives or popular support, consumer arrests continue. More than 90,000 of the approximately 112,000 drug arrests nationally in 2013-14 were for drug consumer offences, representing an arrest every six minutes. Arrest, arrests for drug consumer offences have made up about two-thirds of all drug arrests over the past two decades. And after declining, as you can see in the chart, from just under 10,000, sorry, this is referring to a different chart, after declining from just under 100,000 arrests in 1995 to 96, the number of arrests began to climb again, I mean in absolute terms, from 2001 to 2002. But standardised um, per 100,000 people, as in the chart that you can see on the screen, we can see that after a decade of stability, the arrest rate began to increase in real terms in 2010-2011. And note that the increase in overall arrests was driven by an increase in drug consumer arrests, while drug provider arrests remained relatively stable. Now, uh, reporting on the National ICE Task Force consultations in 2015, Minister Fiona Nash observed that from Lismore to Geraldton, police said the same thing. We can't arrest our way out of this. We need help from the whole community. 
So we are in a state of incoherence where the commonplace, and it was said by many people in many contexts, of we can't arrest our way out coincides with increasing consumer arrests. Despite the absence of any explicit strategy behind drug consumer arrests, it's possible to deduce underlying beliefs that perpetuate the practice that the use of prohibited substances is inherently abuse and, uh, and causes substantial harm, that criminalization and enforcement establish a social norm against the use of illegal drugs, that enforcement is an effective deterrent against the use of, illegal, of, of prohibited substances, and that, and that the criminalization of drug use provides a, a net social benefit. None of these is supported by evidence. And of course, international comparisons show there's little correlation between consumer law enforcement regimes and rates of drug use. Uh, a, a, similar experience, a, a similar effect was observed in relation to the decriminalization of cannabis possession in South Australia. None of the studies found an increase in cannabis use attributable, attributable to the introduction of the cannabis expiation scheme there. So while the criminalization of drug use might not have its intended effects, it has other important effects. Illegality promotes secrecy around drug use and a reluctance to seek help when problems occur. It actively creates harm by placing users at a risk of a drug conviction that can have a serious long life consequences, detrimentally impacting on education, employment, housing, travel and relationships. So given that we, we need help from the whole community, Fiona Nash should have been concerned that by legitimizing discrimination, the criminalization of drug use has produced stigma and social marginalization. It alienates a large number of the people with a great deal to contribute to creating safe, healthy and resilient communities, drug users ourselves. About 15% of Australians in 2013 uh, reported illicit, recent illicit use of drugs, and that was very similar in the more recent National Drug Strategy Household Survey uh, from 2016. The real proportion is likely to be higher, given that people who use illicit drugs are often unwilling to admit use in social surveys. And I just have to stop and note that I'm referring to a study which I absolutely love, lead authored by Jenny Chalmers, again a UNSW piece of research that identified a declining willingness in particular to report methamphetamine use over time. I note this in particular because you often hear even people who are policy experts referring to the national drug strategy as if it were a real representation of population level drug use. What to say but like come on people. That's not what surveys do, and there is always survey error, and we know that with these surveys there is a, you know, a, there is a measurable survey error and a low willingness to report use of prohibited substances to government-run surveys. We've got to stop doing that. It's additionally a problem in that the National Drug Household Survey is one of the main sources of indicators for so-called success for the national drug strategy. We need to take that on rather than reinforcing that. So 42% of people um, in 2013, I need to update that, but nevertheless, the numbers are roughly the same. 42% of people reported lifetime illicit drug use. And among ad adults under 40, lifetime use of prohibited substance is more common than not. Most people have committed that offence. So a strategy to promote safe, healthy and resilient communities through a whole of community engagement would need to recognise that use of prohibited substances is common in the community and that people who use drugs, people like me, have to be part of the solution. Right, in order to do that, I think we need to move beyond harm minimisation. I think I might have a slide about that. I do, here we go. So the concept of harm minimization, as I um, suggested before in those slides, I looked at some historical um, writing around the time that the concept began to emerge. The concept emerged in the 1970s in where, within a context where prohibition was clearly failing to control the availability of prohibited substances. 
But the conceivable alternative, legalization, then as it continues to now seem overly permissive towards drug use. Harm minimization was, I would argue, a compromise position. It disendorsed or questioned prohibition while leaving it largely intact. Over the last 30 years, we've seen that harm minimization can mean just about anything to anyone. And harm minimization, harm minimization activities sometimes pull in opposite directions. For example, police enforce prohibition as a way to achieve harm minimization through supply reduction, but also help perpetuate an unnecessarily harmful market where consumers don't know the contents of the products that they're sold. Despite the diversity, I think one thing in common across divergent versions of harm minimization is that concern about permissiveness. This is at heart a moral concern, and it's a reasonable one. Given that there are risks associated with drug use, a just say yes approach wouldn't promote well-being, or protect well-being at least. The problem is that concerns about seeming permissive towards drug use has led to a culture of permissiveness toward the failure and harm of the prohibitionist abstentionist system itself. After 30 years of harm minimization, we haven't seen major law reforms. Harm minimization has helped introduce crucial new services like needle and syringe exchange for injecting drug users, but has left a harm-promoting legal framework largely intact. The fear that endorsing legalization would seem unnecessarily permissive towards drug use means that the harm minimization framework has been unacceptably permissive towards the use of criminal sanctions in relation to drugs. The idea that prohibition doesn't work has called out prohibition, uh, has called out the criminalization of drug use for failing to reduce drug use, but has been too silent about the fact that in harming people who haven't harmed others, the criminalization of drug use is morally wrong. It has had too little to say about the fact that prohibition has failed to properly regulate a market and in that failure promoted diverse and substantial harm. Harm minimization is easily made complicit with the legal status quo. That's a moral and strategic problem and I think we need a new approach. The great majority of people who use legal or prohibited substances have shown themselves to be capable of remaining accountable and responsible. These are important values alongside permission. And we have, I think, something to learn here that is relevant to drug laws. Permissiveness should be combined with accountability and responsibility. Our drug laws permit the criminal justice system to harm people unjustly, and those laws are not held to account. This is a moral problem that we cannot continue to avoid. A better future needs accountability and responsibility from our leaders, at least as much as from ourselves. Perpetuating criminalization on the basis of concerns about permissiveness shows an unacceptable lack of faith in people. Perpetuating harm minimization is, I, would, I am arguing, suggesting, making the case for, is complicit with that lack of faith and it gives a free pass to failure and harm. I believe we need laws that recognize and enhance our capabilities to care for ourselves and treat other people like we want to be treated. Harm minimization is not enough. Now, reviewing Australian drug policy in 2012, um, to, um, John Fitzgerald and I've, I'm afraid I cannot remember Ms. Seward's first name, but nevertheless, there you go. This is a um, statement that they made about the value of harm minimization in uniting the sector. And I, I think it's true that it did do that. It was right for its time because it managed to unite people. But the people that it united were primarily an expert sector. I also believe that a broader unity is most likely on the basis of a positive aspiration, which harm minimization is not. Now, if that seems crazy, let's look at the uh, vision for the fifth national mental health plan. This is the draft fifth national mental health plan that's currently been released for public consultation. 
the first um, point there, of course, is that more people will have good mental health and well-being. Why is this kind of vision not possible when it comes to drugs? The reality is, though, we've already got a positive aspiration, safe, healthy, and resilient communities. What I think is we need... Whoop, what, what, what we need, I think, is a different framework to sit underneath it. And here is one. Divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary strategies, echoing uh, the three pillars, but not tied to that. Essentially, this is that the primary um, work of promoting well-being is in safe, resilient, and healthy communities and that those communities create low prevalence of risk factors and high prevalence of protective factors against drug-related problems. Secondary strategies for promoting safety and well-being are to are safer drug use itself. And, and tertiary strategies of treatment and rehabilitation for people whose drug use is causing substantial harm. Now, now a lot of this, and here's... Um, a, a, a detailed account or a list, I suppose, of some of the sorts of strategies that I think there is already an evidence base to support. And in putting together this particular slide, which I'm afraid I'm not going to dwell on today because we don't have time, I'm just going to pull out a few parts of it. But I drew in particular on the uh, the Helen Laps uh, Helen Lapsley, yes, study uh, evaluating prevent uh, harm prevention strategies essentially ditched the harm prevention frame and kept all the evidence about what worked to promote well-being to create this list. A lot of this is already covered in the current national drug strategy. I'm not advocating that we throw the whole thing away. Uh, what I'm trying to point to is an incoherence and uh, point to and address is an incoherence. So today I'm going to focus on, in the brief uh, time left, just these things. The role of communities as a primary strategy, and then a secondary strategy, self-regulation by people who use drugs, social regulation of drug use through peer education, and the decriminalization of drug use and personal possession. Reviewing the number of pages that I have left, I'm going to have to make this slightly more concise than I had intended, but I um, will just do the greatest hits version. The idea that we need help from the whole community to prevent drug-related related problems could not be more true, and to some extent this was recognised in the National Drug Strategy 2010-2015. That version identified the importance of protective factors, including having a job, a stable family life, and stable housing in preventing or overcoming drug-related problems, and described how, and I'm quoting, Socially inclusive communities and resilient individuals and families are less likely to engage in harmful drug use. Resilient individuals can adapt to changes and negative events more easily and reduce the impacts that stresses have on their lives and are less likely to use drugs. Resilient and inclusive communities are characterized by strong social networks and work together to support individuals who need assistance. They also promote safe and healthy lifestyles. Well, that's all gone from the Turnbull government's version. The closest it gets to acknowledging an active role for communities is through mentioning them among other occasional partners in the partnership section of the strategy, but it is literally a mention. So moving on to some of the secondary strategies, recognizing this is uh, the amount of time available, self-regulation by people who use drugs. There is substantial evidence that more, most people who use illicit drugs are able to effectively self-regulate their use, indicating the importance of self-regulation as a strategy for promoting safe, healthy and resilient communities. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime 2014 World Drug Report found that globally, what they defined as problem drug users, which they defined as regular drug users and those with drug use disorders or dependence, I would fit into that category, represented approximately one in 10 people who used illicit drugs. A recent review observed that the majority of, Ill of illegal drug use is non-problematic, non most commonly associated with leisure, 
pleasure and desired <coughs> outcomes, and rarely does drug use lead to addiction or require treatment. Furthermore, the review found evidence that most people use drugs responsibly, sensibly, and recreationally. Most drug taking is controlled rather than chaotic. Drug use is usually enjoyable and pleasurable. Most people exercise agency and choose to use drugs rather than finding ourselves propelled by a series of external pressures and or negative life experiences. And most drug use does not result in drug-related crime. Just as a point, I think we need to be careful though in when we talk about problematic versus non-problematic drug use, sometimes we fall into the trap of saying that some drug users are problematic drug use, whereas I think it's more time-bound. There are certainly periods where I think I have reflected upon my own drug use and thought that it was problematic um, and have been able to move out of that. So they're not people that we're talking about, they're patterns of use. Um, I'm going to skip over, no, okay, here we go. Social regulation of drug use through peer education. Peer education is an effective means of social regulation of behavior. And most young people say that they turn to a friend for information about alcohol or other drugs. The full extent of informal peer education has not been measured, but in my experience, it's commonplace and foundational. Formal peer education programs have been implemented and evaluated, particularly in the dance club or rave environment where they provide advice about proper hydration, you know, all, all the stuff. Research that has compared the effectiveness of peer-based outreach with traditional outreach supports the greater effectiveness of peer-based models. Peer education is credible, cost-effective, empowering, and beneficial for those involved. Access accesses hard-to-reach populations, reinforces learning through ongoing contact, and provides positive role models. Finally then, just to touch on the decriminalization of personal possession and use of drugs as another critical secondary strategy for promoting safe, healthy, and resilient communities. Decriminalizing drug use and personal possession would have both direct and indirect effects that would increase the safety of people who use drugs and contribute to safe, healthy, and resilient communities. The most direct effect would be to make people safe from arrest for drug use and personal possession of drugs, of course. A substantial indirect effect would be to increase the accessibility of treatment and of services that promote safety among people who use drugs. Now, of course, as you'll probably mostly be aware, a number of um, organisations and people have endorsed the decriminalisation of drug use in recent years, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, the World Health Organisation, UNAIDS, and others. And of course, decriminalisation of drug use and personal possession in Portugal has reduced the burden on the criminal justice system while contributing to social and health benefits, including a substantial reduction in the rate of drug-related death. In addition, the criminalization of drug use, as I mentioned before, permits the people who enforce law to harm people unjustly, and that's morally wrong. It, it also alienates millions of people with a great deal to contribute to creating safe, healthy, and resilient communities drug users ourselves, and that's crazy. So, to summarize, the National Drug Strategy is no longer fit for purpose. It's become everything to everyone that has also steadily evolved in the direction of what has been, I would argue, the only rhetorically coherent position across that time, with, which is the prevention of drug use. The perennialism of better evaluation is needed, which I mentioned was even a feature of the BOEM report in the 1970s, and the ongoing sidelining of the research centres, which were funded under the National Campaign Against Drug Abuse in 1985, and of which the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre here at UNSW is, is one. The ongoing sidelining of the research centres and evidence points to a fundamental problem with accountability and responsibility in drug policy. The shoddy process for the development of the current national drug strategy indicates that an intervention is needed. We need to move beyond harm minimization and beyond the idea that prohibition is bad just because it doesn't work. Like other forms of totalitarianism, prohibition gets the relationship between governments and citizens wrong. Wrong as in morally wrong. 
Safe, healthy and resilient communities are a good vision because people and communities do the main care and protective work in societies. Laws, law enforcement and other services should support people and communities in that work. And people who use drugs deserve equity on the basis of our personhood. People who use drugs are also part of community and have a stake and role in promoting well-being in a world with drugs. Equity in society and law is therefore in everyone's interests. Or, in one sentence, the national drug strategy is a piece of shit and it's up to all of us to fix it. Now, like I mentioned at the start, I'm an activist rather than an academic, and I'm hoping to encourage an intervention of some kind. So my question for you, and I acknowledge we don't have much time left, it doesn't have to be a question that's answered today, but I think it needs an answer, is what can we do about this? How can we fix this situation? Thanks for your time today. Isn't uh, building more rat parks the um, one of the solutions, if you know what I mean? In a sense, that is what I'm arguing for, yes. So the question is about the rat park experiment, which, experiment which found that essentially rats in an environment that promoted well-being were less likely to use prohibited substances. Uh, yeah, in, in, on, on a different scale, that is uh, a version of what I am arguing for, that safe, healthy and resilient communities is a good vision for the national drug strategy because those are the kind of communities that promote well-being and well-being, which can go hand in hand with non-medical drug use, also reduces the uh, risk of harm from drug use because it reduces the, the, the kinds of risk factors for the most harmful forms of drug use, experience of trauma being one of the most substantial of those. Wait, I thought the, um, your schedule was 5.30, so I think you may have more time than you think. Mm. No, I no, wish no, that were true. Right. <laughs> you know, for those of us that don't have anywhere to go, uh, there's just wine and cheese out there, but uh, I'm happy to go past five if you want, so have a think while I get this to rock. Um, so that was a great and depressing uh, overview of the national strategy. I thought that was really good. And then it, it, it demonstrated to us how far we've gone to the right. Mm -hmm. you know, 15 years ago, we were much more mm -hmm. progressive, much more committed to harm, minimization mm -hmm. of waste and harm reduction. Certainly. 15 years ago being year 2000. Mm -hmm. Well, we had drug services, statewide drug mm -hmm. services that were really all about harm reduction. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have those now. Yep. Um, and that, that horrible moralistic stuff that's gone into our national strategy now is, mm -hmm. is horrific. Uh -huh. But your strategy now, I'm looking at it thinking, I think everyone in the room would agree with that. that that's delightful, especially those second tiered strategies. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to get there. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to plug mm -hmm. on harm and say, like, how can we get involved? What are the sort of mechanisms uh -huh. for us to start getting into that discourse? Uh -huh. Thanks for the question. So many things that I want to say. Uh, maybe I'll start with the last one. I'm not sure that unharm is necessarily the vehicle for this kind of work, I, but I think it is a vehicle for part of this work. One of the things that I think is a really important part of that work is to develop a rhetorically coherent position that can be as strong as the position that I think set us on the path that we're on right now, that's playing out right now, which was powers tough on drugs. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my reading of history is that Howard was the first Australian Prime Minister who really made drugs a thing, you know? Before him, it was, they were an issue, but they were part of his public persona, Top on Drugs was part of his public persona in a way that was like for Richard Nixon, but we didn't have a predecessor in Australia for that kind of position. And I think that what we're seeing now is the long tail of, and the, you know, that aspiration to introduce prevention into the national drug strategy began to surface in the Howard years, and I think now we are seeing it there, right? Uh, see, seeing it actually formally incorporated into the strategy. 
So unharm, you know, one of the things that is the um, work of unharm is to develop that well-being framework, a positive aspiration that um, moves away from what I think is the incoherence of harm minimization towards something that actually connects with people on the basis of values. So yeah, I think that unharm has a role in that work. At the same time, I think that there are other forms of, I guess, political activism that need to happen, one of which being, I guess, a kind of ra radicalization of the expert sector because it has been progressively sidelined. And I think that we've seen that in the current national drug strategy. You know, we, uh, it'd be interesting to see which of the centers, so we've got NDARC here and CEDAR in South Australia and NDRA in Western Australia, which of those centers felt like they uh, were able to make a substantial contribution to the current national drug strategy? Well, I can confidently assume that it would be none of them. I've, you know, I've seen their submissions, they are not reflected in the current strategy. Um, so, yeah, I think that there is other work as well. And, but just to wrap up, I think it has to be about coming up with that positive, you know, it has to be organized around a positive aspiration, which well being is one equity is another and that and and terms like harm minimization harm reduction for all that has been achieved within that framework i think are not fit for purpose to do the work we need to do hi i'm sally nathan i'm here in the school of public health so i'm working with young people with mm -hmm. problematic usually time dependent mm -hmm. um, drug and alcohol issues and they're the ones who are really being harmed by a lot of this policy mm -hmm. they're vulnerable they've become homeless they can't get a job they've been arrested etc and I do agree we need to come together, but I think there's something to be said for more covert. So maybe we all have the same message, but I think mm -hmm. multiple voices coming from multiple sectors is actually going to be more powerful than us all joining unharm, even though I like the work that you do. So I think there needs to be some way to have that conversation and look at how we can from our various places of hopefully some power have an influence on the way uh -huh. this is talked about in the agenda. I, absolutely. And I think that we make the mistake of thinking, so we, you people, make the mistake of thinking that we're not powerful, when in fact we do have accesses to forms of power that are just not sufficiently organised. And I think that you're right, that I don't think it's about us all joining the same organisation. I have... Yeah, just a leftist, you know, we're all out there. But we'll, we'll be, be positioned if we all come together. Mm -hmm. However, this just especially in the last six months or so, I've been blown away by some of the new organisations, people, and processes that have been introduced into this space to do some of that covert, I suppose. Work it sounds a bit conspirational, <laughs> conspiratorial, um, but to do some of that work of uh, aligning people who speak from different positions and. To be honest, today, this morning, I sat in the Senate inquiry into the Welfare Reform Bill 2017. I'd say invisible and coalitions might be nicer than covert. Invisible coalitions. And I think that the potential for invisible coalitions was absolutely represented in a way that I found thrilling this morning, where Alison Ritter, for example, spoke as one among uh, about five people, all of whom I'd been working with, who were all aligned on message, absolutely clear in disendorsing the three schedules that relate to people with substance use disorders. And I think we're actually going to, we're actually going to win it. And that form of power, you know, it's, it's beginning to happen and that's really exciting. And, uh, and yeah, I think that it will begin to, as it begins to show power, it will bring more people into that um, sort of alignment and activism, and it, it's exciting. It's great. Are people happy to take a few more questions? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your talk, Ben Dobelka from Uniting. Um, I understand that words matter, but I'm just wondering how do you prevent? Uh, police arresting people under the disguise mm -hmm. of implementing a well-being policy? Uh -huh. uh, that's uh -huh. one question. Because I don't think that harm reduction or harm minimization inherently has to do with reducing harms from prohibition. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of the interpretations of the term and police taking yeah. over. And the second important question, I really like how you emphasize the self-regulation. Mm -hmm. But I'm really wondering also how do you enact self-regulation from the policy perspective like how do you make people self-regulate or self-organize? Mm -hmm. Isn't there a little bit of a contradiction so, even okay, to, yeah. to okay, ask so people to do something? 
themselves. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll answer the second one first. The National Drug Strategy is a strategy for government. It is a plan of action that is intended to organise the federal and state government activities in relation to the drugs. The, what I am arguing for is that, in fact, people and communities are the primary uh, place where well-being happens and that the role of government is a supportive one, right? I think that self-regulation is not necessarily... It's something that should be supported at the policy level, but it's not for government to enact. And I think part of the problem is, is that we have created a framework, a top-down framework that we need to unwind. And the unwinding doesn't necessarily involve an... Ex sorry, it necessarily does not involve an expanded role for government. It uh, involves doing government in different ways. So I think that self-regulation has to happen through, for example, peer education much more than it does uh, necessarily through policy levers that government might pull. The second one is on the thing about how do you stop police arresting people on the basis of well, well-being. Yeah, absolutely. What, the words are not sufficient to enact the kind of political change that we want to see in the world. There are ways of orienting political activism that also needs to be clear about what we're calling out about what we're opposed to, about what is wrong. And then it won't magically make those things unwind. It is a strategy for uniting people around a particular position that will require ongoing work to reinforce and defend. And it will be on that basis that I think we can use those positive constructs to unwind some of the harmful practices. You know, not, not through a, there is a tendency toward, especially among messaging consultants to think that words have a magical power. They have an almost magical power, but they're not sufficient. Um, yeah, it's, it's a framework for organizing political activism rather than a solution in itself. Thanks. I think it's hard to know what the mic, I might make it one myself. Um, it, it's easy to, I guess, uh, to idealise um, countries from afar, but it does seem like Portugal has nailed it in many respects. And one of the things that I like about their response, going back to your point around communities, well, and, and the importance mm -hmm. of us constituting communities and the importance of resilient communities, is that for those people in Portugal under the current decriminalisation uh, who end up sort of in, in trouble, sort of repeat offenders, if you like, uh, there's the, the, they are required to, where they are given assistance, um, which is now readily available because of all the money that Portugal has saved by not insisting on supply and production and, and the uh, criminalisation of drug use, that, that money has now gone into less of an emphasis on detoxes and rehabs and those traditional kind of forms of redress, if you like. But, uh, but uh, emphasising uh, social reintegration programs, so getting people housing, getting people trained, getting people into jobs, re-established back in the community. And what I like about that is it gets away from this fetishisation of the individual drug and the individual pattern of use and more about the relationship between the individual and their place in the community. And to me, I think that's an admirable response mm -hmm. and seems to gesture a little bit to what you're talking uh -huh. about. Yeah, and I guess just to add to that uh, as a comment, because I, I essentially agree, is that I think that it is a reminder to us in advocating for law reform that law reform is a tool. I think there has been a tendency uh, to see law reform as the objective, as the thing that we're all in this for. I'm in this more for equity, equity in the sense of both fairness, but also having a stake in community, equity in the more, if you like, neoliberal sense, but I think also one that is not necessarily defined by that. Um, and I think that it's important that we uh, advocate on the basis of those kinds of concepts and on the basis of the capacity, yeah, well, you know, here I am, like this is an ad for unharm, but on the capacity of communities to do that caring work and for reintegration and reconnection with communities as uh, the basis for promoting well-being at the individual level, much more than yeah, you know, um, criminalization or even the absence of criminalization. Uh, any final 
Hey, well, as like a young person studying at university, um, hoping to, in my life, like be part of some sort of law reform process, how can I ensure that I don't become sort of implicit with this, like, mm-hmm. what you describe, like, crappy policy or sort of like, obviously mm-hmm. there's something that's going on within, like, government policy that is just not providing the results we need. How can I ensure that I don't just become part of that sort of thing? Ah. Uh. I don't know. um, I mean, that is basically my own experience of being drawn into forms of, especially a bureaucracy that I found were reinforcing things that were wrong. And I think that um, forms of violence get rendered really subtly within bureaucracies so that it can be hard to detect. And so it's a real risk. I'm not sure there is really any solution except to maintain a critical perspective and... um, a vision of what you want life to be like and to test the work that you do against that. I mean, that sounds really abstract even in saying it, but I think that would be my, my answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you mentioned that the National Drug Strategy doesn't endorse criminalization of mm-hmm. drug use. Does it endorse decriminalization or at least enabling legal environments? And has that terminology strengthened or weakened over time? And then my second question, sorry uh-huh. if you'll permit me. Um, so I wonder what was if a bit about environments? What? Enabling legal okay. environments or some other kind has, of language that is like a okay, pseudonym for decriminalization. Has made it into the national drug strategy? Yeah. No, not yet. Okay. Anyway, but I'll ask the other part when you do it. I'm wondering if you could speak to or clarify the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Okay. And I'm thinking about how we speak about, for example, decriminalization of sex work and similar uh-huh. strategies, and mm-hmm. we think about them in terms of um, uh, removal of police as regulators, the removal of all criminal laws, mm-hmm. not only around sex workers, but around brothels and clients mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah. Um, and removal of specific laws around sex work, is it the same way that we speak to around decriminalization? Are we only speaking about drug use or are we speaking mm-hmm. about a range of other activities? And then what, thinking about legalization, for me coming from a sex work background, mm-hmm. I think of that in terms of licensing and standardization mm-hmm. and there's all these other pitfalls around that in terms of then accidentally criminalizing other groups who, who mm-hmm. can't comply. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. Okay, so on the first point, the National Drug Strategy does not endorse decriminalization, it, except that it endorses diversion, which is a form of de facto decriminalization, so de- of use and possession. It, diversion is only for consumer offences uh, in Australia. So, yes, to a sense it is in there, but only implicitly. Um, the thing about decriminalization versus legalization, it's like this perennial problem and, it, you know, you always get into these like, uh, definitional discussions in policy contexts, which I find really unhelpful and I think point to the ineffectiveness of the language in representing a position, especially a coherent position. I think we need to talk about legal and social equity as a positive aspiration. Decriminalization is another negative aspiration that doesn't actually express what we're aspiring to. Having said that, when people talk about decriminalization, like in Portugal, they're primarily talking about decriminalization of consumer offenses, so of possess uh, or use a prohibited substance or to use a uh, Schedule 4 substance in a non-medically indicated way. Um, it's a kind of, you know, even in saying that, like, really complex definition, like, I think you get a sense of the unhelpfulness of it as a way of sort of articulating a position. It is disti- typically distinguished from legalization, which is t- typically used, not for any particular reason, but just by convention to refer to uh, the, the market, the supply side, so to uh, create avenues for legal access to what are currently prohibited substances and now within the regulate regulation model that is uh, very popular within the law reform drug law reform movement uh, it is typically talked about as legal regulation you know and then with reference to the kind of regulatory strategies that legalization enables like for example it enables in relation to alcohol 
But with that thing that you mentioned about how, you know, um, about how other things can continue to be criminal even in the context of the legal system, that is something I think that is really well exemplified by the New Zealand uh, Psychiatric Substances Act of 2013, which was sort of like celebrated in the international policy community as creating a pathway to legal regulation for new psychoactive substances. At the same time as it maintained the criminalization of possession and use of very commonly used substances in New Zealand, and of course the most commonly used prohibited substance in New Zealand is cannabis. So it's like setting up this complex, like pretty in large ways until they got caught on an animal testing issue, pretty like workable, great piece of regulation for markets, for supply and um, distribution, for manufacture and supply. But left the, on this really harm creating other legal structure intact and yeah there is that risk that uh, progress that it doesn't I think I think that's the reason why concepts like equity are important to have a point of orientation for the kinds of reforms that we want to make sure that we aren't doing those kinds of perverse things where we do one form of reform but maintain another form of arbitrary punishment. Pleasure. <laughs> Sorry, I the no, very, no, very last. Right. It's, it's perhaps a related um, point, but I'm interested in your reflections on the drug court mm -hmm. um, and how it's kind of badged as a diversionary measure, uh -huh. but often actually, you know, kind of increases surveillance or the involvement of the criminal justice system mm -hmm. in someone's life. Um, and in a sense can kind of entrench that. So even though it's kind of badged as a diversionary measure, perhaps can have the opposite. Um, yeah, it. it's sort of, div It's I, I don't know if it's formally called Cost is diversion. Drug costs are interesting. They've come up very recently, especially in relation to the Welfare Reform Bill. Uh, federal government is very interested in uh, coercion or mandate, mandate or mandated treatment, and so they're very interested in exploring issues, and drug courts have come up in relation to that. I mean, drug courts are a better alternative to incarceration. So drug courts are just for people who are going to be serving a prison sentence in a prison where they've probably got very limited access to forms of treatment because the treatment system within prisons is absolutely abominable, right? And so in that context, where it's an alternative to incarceration, which involves just sitting in a cell for 19 hours a day, potentially, it's a better thing, right? You know, you've got more opportunity and there are evaluations that show, for example, people in 2000 evaluations show people went 60 more days before they committed an offence if they'd been in a compulsory treatment centre. So not like a radical result but it is in a sense better but it, you know I, I think what you're getting at is the concern that that would be like a good enough strategy for dealing with the system with something that actually needs a more systemic kind of uh, reform and I would agree that that is also completely valid and drug courts are not the end point um, they are a better than incarceration you know alternative um, that have had good results for some people, but they're a stepping stone toward um, a, a more important and fundamental reform. Um, well, listen, I, I think we'll leave it there. Please um, hang around. Uh, have, a, have a glass of your drug of choice. And, um, uh, and thank really? you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.